All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. As Chris said, my name is Erin Garrett, and I'm an energy and environmental stewardship educator for University of Illinois Extension. I am based in Union County, and I serve the southernmost five counties of Illinois. Prior to my time with Extension, I worked for the Nature Conservancy doing prairie restoration, management, and monitoring work. And then I studied the invasive species Ceresia lespidiza in grasslands at Southern Illinois University. Um, so that's a little bit of my background and how I got interested in prairies and prairie invasive species. Um, and today we are going to be taking a look at how invasive species in prairies have evolved to take advantage of a disturbance dependent ecosystem. All right, so just to start with an outline of what we'll be talking about today, we're going to start by looking at the ecology of a prairie. So looking at how a prairie functions. And this is an important first step um, because prairies are an early successional ecosystem and they rely on disturbance um, to stay healthy. And that's one way that invaders are able to get in and be so successful in establishing in this ecosystem. So after we look at how a prairie functions, we'll shift to exploring how invasive species established in prairies and why they're able to be so successful. We'll follow that by looking at some invader profiles. So we're going to look at um, 11 different species, um, talk in general just about their life history, how they're able to be successful, and a few best management practices for each of those. And then we'll follow that off and wrap up the afternoon with a few general best management practices. Um, so just a few things to keep in mind when managing invasives in prairies. All right, so let's just start off by talking about what our vision of a prairie looks like. So our average person, and I used to be one of them, um, typically looks at a prairie and just sees a field full of grass. Um, and one of the most iconic prairie grasses that we think of is big blue stem or turkey foot, which is pictured here. This grass is actually the state grass of Illinois. Uh, but if you're familiar with prairies, you know that there's a huge amount of diversity, not only of grasses, but also of other species like forbs or wildflowers. Some that we have pictured here are purple coneflowers and prairie smoke, which is my personal favorite. There are also non-dominant shrubs present in a prairie. So it is normal and healthy to have some woody species in a prairie. One example of those is lead plant. That's the picture on the right. And some of our flowering plants are also legumes or nitrogen fixers. Um, lead plant just happens to be a woody species that is also a nitrogen fixer. So all together, um, these different plants comprise a prairie. But when we describe them in general, we usually say they're dominated by grasses. Um, because of the vegetation that exists in a prairie and the way that it grows, which we'll dive into in a little bit, prairies have developed an extremely rich soil that is, has contributed to the success of agriculture throughout the state. And maybe the most important characteristic of a prairie for today's talk is that they are maintained through disturbance. And this need for disturbance may seem counterintuitive at first because on the surface it looks like we're harming the prairie to keep it healthy because we are taking away some of that vegetation from those desirable native species to promote further growth. Um, but as we'll, as we'll talk about as we move forward, removing that above ground vegetation has a whole suite of positive effects, um, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. So let's look at some of the diversity of native prairie grasses, typically found in the tall grass prairie in Illinois. Um, so even though it's called the tall grass prairie, there is a huge range of um, growth patterns of grasses. So we have really short ones that only grow about a foot tall, like blue grandma in the top left corner. We have some kind of mid-height species like side oats grandma grass and little blue stem. And then probably the ones that most people are familiar with when it comes to characterizing a tall grass prairie are big blue stem, Indian grass, and switchgrass. Those are the three main dominant prairie grass types that we find throughout the state. Okay, 
Um, but besides grasses, there are lots of other flowering plants and forbs that we find in a prairie. So in Illinois, it's estimated that we have about 850 different species of plants in our prairies. Um, that includes grasses, shrubs, sedges, and forbs. The majority of that number is going to be these flowering plants or forbs. So here's just 10 of my favorites. Um, definitely doesn't even start to um, explore all of the diversity that we have. But many of us are probably familiar with the cone flowers that you see on the screen here, some of the silphiums like our prairie dock and compass plant. And maybe one of my personal favorites is rattlesnake master because it looks like something that should be growing out west, but we're lucky enough to have it um, in our state here. Now, while there are about 850 different plant species that can be found in prairies, if we're looking at the number we can expect to find in a high quality restoration or remnant site, we're looking at somewhere between 100 and 120 would be a good mix that we could expect to find. Now, while there's much beauty above ground in a prairie, the majority of plant growth actually occurs underground. So anywhere between 10 to 40 percent of total prairie plant biomass is above ground, and then the rest of that is going to be found below ground. So prairie plants form extensive deep root systems, and this is part of the reason they are so well adapted to a disturbance-dependent ecosystem. Because of these roots, a great deal of carbon is able to be stored underground. So unlike in other ecosystems, um, say in a forest, which stores its carbon above ground in those trees, prairies store carbon below ground in their roots. And partially because of this, prairie soils have a very dark, nearly black A horizon with high amounts of organic matter and high fertility. So here you can see a very popular um, sketch that shows the underground prairie um, with those vast root systems. If you're not able to see um, the scales on the sides of the screen, uh, it shows a depth of 15 feet. So some plants like lead plant and um, one of our blazing star species, they can produce roots that grow 15 feet deep in the soil and their above ground plant um, only grows about one to two feet tall. So really, really extensive root systems. And on average between five and 10 feet deep um, is, is a pretty average range for our, our prairie plant roots. So this root system is one mechanism that allows these plants to withstand periodic disturbances. And disturbance is needed to keep prairies in the early stages of succession and keep out those woody species. So grazers and fire are part of the natural ecosystem. The original grazers on prairies were bison, elk, and deer, while the first originator of fire was lightning. Now it's important to point out that by the time the Europeans first viewed North America's prairies, Native Americans have been successfully using fire to alter the landscape by mimicking that natural disturbance regime. So they would set fires to clear woody vegetation, create more grassland habitat, because that was the habitat for their food source, the bison and the elk that they were looking to hunt. Um, they would also burn to flush fresh growth, which would attract the bison, bringing the bison to them that they could then hunt. Um, so this all just shows that, that human influence on the prairie is a long-standing part of prairie management. And because we've altered the landscape so much, we no longer can have, say, a lightning strike start a fire that burns for miles and miles over a couple days until it's put out by a rainstorm. Um, so we need to help put that disturbance back on the prairie. But how do each of these disturbances in and of themselves impact the prairie? Well, fire is, is pretty complicated, um, but there are some general trends that we can um, discuss. So fire is definitely going to alter our plant composition. Um, one way it does this is it can knock back our woody species. And in general, it can either promote or decrease the abundance of other groups of plant species. And to a great deal, this depends on the seasonality of the burn and the frequency of burning. Um, so for example, if we burn down um, a plant when it's in its flowering stage, that can harm its reproductive potential for that season and um, prevent its success for that year. Um, but also we can, through burning, scarify and germinate seeds of other plants that then would be promoted by that fire. 
Um, a specific example is if we burn early in the spring, we can promote the growth of cool season grasses. But if we burn late in the spring, we can promote the growth of warm season grasses. And I'll talk about that example um, much more as we get into exploring some of our specific invasive grasses in prairies. Fire is also going to remove the standing leaf litter in a prairie and that um, extra biomass that builds up year after year. So you can see in this picture all of that standing um, dead biomass that's being burned away. This is going to improve the light availability um, for those seedlings to germinate. It's going to release bound nutrients, help warm the soil, and also increase the amount of soil microbial activity that is occurring in the soil. Okay, burning is also going to change our nutrient cycling. So through burning, we are releasing nitrogen and carbon. Um, and the interesting thing with carbon is um, it's being released from that, that plant matter, but with that increased um, soil microbial activity and new growth of plants, we're actually stimulating the growth of those root systems, which allows that carbon to then be stored deeper into the ground. So carbon's kind of gonna change where it's being stored. I like to include this series of photos here because it really shows just how quickly a prairie can come back after a burn. So in the top picture, you can see the standing um, litter from previous years in this prairie right before they burned it. The second picture is what that landscape looks like um, after a pretty successful burn. They didn't have too, too much patchiness in that one at all. Um, and then in that third picture, you can see just two weeks after the burn, how much green has come back right away. I always like to um, think back to the first time that I returned to a prairie after doing a prescribed burn. And it was about a week later and we were trying to obviously increase our diversity of native species, decrease those invasives. And one plant in particular that we just saw in abundance after the burn was the bird's foot violet, which was a rarer violet um, in that landscape that we were managing. So it was astounding just to see how quickly um, that plant was coming back. In that fourth picture, we can see three months post burn. That looks like a healthy prairie. We have many flowering species. All of those grasses have come back in abundance. And then down in the last picture, just six months post burn, you can see that huge amount of biomass that's already come back. Um, so if we were hesitant about, you know, the damage and destruction that it looks like fire is putting on um, the ground, we can see all of this life that has come back um, right away. Another disturbance um, that is prominent on prairies is grazing. And this one is not as dramatic um, as fire, but is more of a longer term ongoing type of disturbance. Um, and in general, if grazing is applied properly, it can result in a higher species richness in prairies and a lower end of season grass abundance. And many of our prairie species have adapted to being grazed um, because they keep um, that tissue that has the new growth um, stemming from it very close to or even slightly underground. So if that plant is grazed at um, the base, then that tissue that has the new growth is not being taken away as well. Um, in many grasses, being grazed um, helps stimulate further growth of those grasses, putting up new shoots that then is a great food source for those grazers. Um, as we talked about earlier, bison were some of those original grazers. Um, we're lucky enough in Illinois to have a few prairie um, restorations that have reintroduced bison, which is great to see. Um, but if we have a smaller scale restoration, obviously having a herd of bison is not going to be feasible. Um, so to some degree, we can use cattle, um, even though they do have different grazing preferences. So. Um, with any grazers on a prairie, um, management and paying attention to where they're eating, how they're concentrating their feeding is very important. And cattle tend to take a little bit more uh, management and rotational grazing to make sure that they're not having detrimental effects on our, our good native species. Okay, one other disturbance I like to point out, um, because it's not something you may have thought about, um, but bison wallows can actually serve as a small scale disturbance um, that creates a microhabitat. 
and um, allows rainfall to collect and host a different suite of plant species. Um, so even those smaller scale disturbances can increase the diversity of our prairies um, and act just in a different way than some of those large scale disturbances. Okay, so now that we've looked at how prairies function, let's take a quick look at where the prairies are in the United States. There are three different prairie types um, across the US, including tall grass, mixed grass, and short grass prairies. As you can probably guess, the gradient of the height of that prairie coincides with the amount of precipitation and the amount of drought that occurs. So as we get further west, we have less rainfall and more drought, so we have shorter um, short grass species um, and other plants that are adapted to having prolonged periods of drought. I also want to show a more detailed map of the tall grass prairie and I really like this illustration because it shows you know that the tall grass prairie isn't just in the Midwest um, but ranges all the way you know up into Canada down to Texas from Nebraska to Indiana and Kentucky so there is a wide range um, where this habitat occurs, even though most of us tend to think of, you know, Illinois and Iowa as, as that tall grass um, prairie uh, location. Unfortunately, in Illinois, we have less than a one hundredth of a percent of our original 22 million acres of prairie that remain in a high quality state. Now, I do want to point out that we do have many prairie restorations. We have some degraded remnants that exist, those are not included in that figure. Um, this is just pointing out um, the degradation of that original high quality state. Um, but because of this, the tall grass prairie is a critically endangered ecosystem. So often what we find remaining are pockets of prairies and locations that were too difficult to plow or places we necessarily wouldn't want to plow in. Um, so things like sand deposits, steep, less hills, railroad right-of-ways we couldn't plow in, we wouldn't want to plow up a cemetery prairie. Um, so those are actually some great sites to go and see um, wonderful uh, remnant prairies. There are about 30 cemetery prairies documented in Illinois, um, so if you have one nearby, I recommend that you go and, and check that out. Okay, I always like to show this photo, and you may have seen it a few times before, because it just really clearly illustrates the loss of prairie habitat um, and the main reason for that loss, um, which is agriculture. Um, so in the left photo, the um, prairie grassland habitat is shown in kind of that tan cream color. And then in the right photo, we can see all of that yellow is agriculture, and we can also see the pink, which is our developed areas. This picture also shows the extent to which we've lost our forests as well. Um, so a really stark contrast um, to show that we really have transformed most of our prairies into agriculture and um, we have really utilized that fertile um, high quality soil that we have in our state. Okay, so for the next portion we're going to start looking at some of the impacts of invasive species in prairies. So here I have listed some of the reasons for the decline of prairies in Illinois, as well as some current barriers to restoration efforts or threats to prairie survival and health. So while invasive species can be taken on their own as a separate category, what we're going to do is look at how each of these other categories listed here below, those six other categories, either include or can be the cause of some invasive species impacts. Um, so we'll soon see how many of these um, other categories were either the cause for introduction of invasive species or perhaps increase the likelihood of invasives establishing or spreading. Okay, so first up we have agriculture with which the invention of the steel plow was the top reason for the decline of prairies. However, ag is still posing a potential threat to our remaining prairies, um, specifically because some weeds that are present in ag fields have become invasive plants. Um, so ones that may sound familiar are crown vetch, Johnson grass, and yellow sweet clover. We can see a patch of Johnson grass in that picture right on the edge of that farm field there. And a big problem comes um, with prairie restorations in particular, because often these sites are converted farm fields. So there used to be prairie, it has been farmed for a hundred, a couple hundred years, and now that land is being converted back into a prairie. Um, and this poses many challenges um, 
And one of them can be a different seed bank. So now there can be a remnant weed seed bank that includes some of these invasive plants that can then pro pose barriers and challenges um, to restoring those areas. Another thing to think about is if you're restoring a former agricultural land back into prairie, um, there's a pretty high likelihood that there are going to be some remaining ag fields around that site. Um, and if they continue to have those weed problems, then they're going to continue to serve as um, a seed source and a potential introduction site as well. So that'll be one um, uphill battle that you may um, encounter. Okay, next is our domestic livestock. Um, so prairies were a great place to have livestock and many new forage species were introduced um, for these grazers. And some of those introduced forage species then turned out um, to be uh, invasive. So again, ones like Johnson grass, Cerecia lespedeza, reed canary grass, tall fescue. Um, these lists are not comprehensive, just a few examples um, that are pointing out along the way. So with the introduction of those species, again, some of those sites that may be um, we may be restoring back to a prairie, we'll have those remnant um, weeds, those remnant invasives that we'll have to be taken care of. Because we have lost so much of our prairies, what remains are often small fragmented pieces. And these pieces therefore have a lot of edge habitat, which is often poor in quality. So this increased amount of edge habitat also results in increased surface area open to invasion. And there have actually been some studies conducted that showed that there's a higher diversity of non-native and invasive species in edge habitats compared to those interior habitats. So I like to include this diagram on the bottom because it shows a few different scenarios uh, which are especially important in restoration um, on how we can reduce chances of invasion and increase the viability of a restoration. Um, so if we look at the one labeled the edge effect, we can see if we have you know, a larger site um, that is more round in shape that has um, less amount of edge area compared to interior area. And we can compare that to you know, four small restorations or one that's perhaps um, longer, more rectangular shaped, that's gonna have a higher amount of edge area. Okay, we've already talked about the importance of fire to maintain healthy prairies, but we have had large scale human induced fire suppression. Um, fortunately, in the past couple of decades, we've really increased our education on the importance of fire, um, but there are still many barriers that remain. Um, lack of funding, small size, or even location. Um, I know where I'm from originally in the um, northwest suburbs of Chicago, there are many small little prairie restorations interspersed with neighborhoods and that poses challenges with burning. Um, I know one, one burn went a little awry and some, some homes uh, siding got a little melted. So there are challenges even with increased education and understanding of that need for fire. So we know if we have fire suppression, we can have increased amounts of woody species, potentially some invasive woody species. Uh, we can have decreased forb abundance and increased vulnerability to those invasive species. Okay, our prairie lands have become degraded over time as well. Um, one main way is through soil erosion. And so to combat soil erosion, many non-native plants were introduced in the early 1900s and then unfortunately became invasive. Um, in this picture, we can see purple crown vetch that was planted on a roadside um, for soil erosion control. And unfortunately, that then led to um, many introductions and invasions that occurred afterwards. And then finally, for numerous other reasons, we've introduced other plants that became invasive, both unintentionally um, through accidental introductions and shipments. Um, there were several invasive species that have been introduced because they were in contaminated seed. Um, before ship ballast was regulated, um, that was a, a main way for a lot of invasives to get brought over. Um, and then there were others that have been intentional. So many ornamental plants that we have um, brought over have then escaped and gotten out into our ecosystems. Um, some invasives were prized for use in floral arrangements like teasel um, and others were planted by beekeepers like sweet clovers. 
So in most cases, you know, we didn't realize the harm that would ensue, but unfortunately, we have landscapes that look like this now. So these are the real consequences of having all of these introductions, and now it's up to us to manage them. Okay, um, this one right here is leafy spurge. This infestation is not in Illinois. This is a picture from Minnesota, um, but you can see that it is turning that prairie into a monoculture of just that one invasive species. Other sites that we may be familiar with, this is um, smooth brome. This one is in a prairie restoration in Northeastern Illinois. You can see all of that standing leaf um, or excuse me, all the inflorescences that are remaining after this grass has gone to seed. And a site that's really common down where I am is an infestation of Cerecia lespedeza. This one is in a restoration site in Southern Illinois. And you can see that it is growing up and then kind of falling over and shading out um, the native vegetation that is underneath. So what is it about these invaders in particular that make them so successful in prairies? Well, I wanted to start by talking about prairie ecology today because it's important to understand um, why these invaders can establish prairies. So mainly they're adapted to disturbance dependent ecosystems. Um, this in and of itself poses a high barrier for us to overcome because um, fire and grazing are often employed as control mechanisms, um, but they can also also results in increases in those invasive species if they're not employed correctly. Um, prairie invaders are also adapted to highlight environments. Um, there is a limited number of ways we can um, manipulate the lighting situation in a prairie. Um, obviously, we don't want to increase that cover of woody species, um, but there are some techniques that can be used to kind of stimulate the growth of those abundant warm season grasses to shade out the seed bank. Um, and it's also important to note that these invasive species are often also found in roadsides and other poor quality disturbed areas, which if left untreated can serve as reservoirs for future reintroductions. Um, so in this picture, there is a whole hillside of sweet clover. So if we were managing a prairie nearby and this, um, you know, seed source wasn't managed, then we're going to constantly have that risk and that potential for that plant to be reintroduced back into our prairie. So let's look at some specific strategies that many of these invaders use. Most of them respond positively to fire, and this can look differently based on the species. Um, so some species um, have seeds that are scarified by fire, that allows them to germinate and then begin to grow. And other species can respond with new tillering after fire. And then there's other re um, responses that can also occur based on changes in those soil and nutrient levels that we talked about earlier. Prairie invaders are often not impacted um, detrimentally by above ground disturbance that occurs based on those natural disturbance regime timelines. Um, and this is because many of them are rhizomatous. So just top killing the plant is not going to um, damage the whole plant and those root systems will then be able to allow that plant to regrow. Many of them have very vigorous growth and their habit or the shape that they take as they grow results in the shading out of other species. And then another tactic um, some use, and we often see this with invasive grasses, is having a different phenology or timing of their life cycle events than native prairie grasses. Um, so with grasses in particular, our native prairie grasses tend to be warm season, um, but invasive grasses tend to be cool season. So they are able to emerge, grow, and set seed all before those warm season grasses are even a foot tall. Um, this can result in increased leaf litter and some shading, um, and some other impacts that can negatively affect the growth of our, of our warm season dominant prairie grasses. As I've mentioned throughout um, the talk today, there are some unique circumstances when it comes to prairie management because many and most of the prairies that we are going to be working in are restorations. So this means that we have a little bit more of an uphill battle um, because we have altered soil conditions and remnant weeds. Um, so this can make them much more vulnerable to invasion um, and make it a lot more challenging to eradicate those invasive species. 
And again, I've talked about it many times, but prairies need disturbance. So if we put disturbance on the ground, we can help increase their health, but we're also increasing their susceptibility to invasion, depending on how we manipulate that disturbance. Okay, so now we're gonna move into looking at some specific um, examples of invasive species, but we're gonna start by looking at a list of non-native plants. Um, this is not comprehensive and not all of them are invasive, but these are just some of the non-native plants that we can find in Illinois prairies. Okay, um, one thing I wanna point out is it's, it can sometimes be challenging to find you know, a given list of invasive plants and prairies. And when I was preparing this presentation, I just tried doing simple things by trying to look up, you know, lists of common prairie invaders. Um, and it's really difficult to find. So there is um, management based on the Illinois Exotic Weed Act. Um, but if you look at which of those species are prairie invaders, the three that are bolded on the screen are the only ones that are currently regulated. So it's important to note that we don't just want to start there. As you were looking through this list, I'm sure most of us are finding one, two, three, maybe 10 <laughs> plants on this list that were like, oh, that acts invasive in the prairie that I'm thinking of in my head, okay? Um, so it's important to, to understand the location that you're managing or working in um, and to know what's a problem in that location and in surrounding locations and then manage and prioritize those species. So today we're gonna to focus on 11 that are widely acknowledged amongst landowners and land managers as invasive in Illinois prairies and then management of them should be a priority. As we look at some species profiles, we'll consider these questions. We'll look at the life history of that invader, looking at how it invades and persists. If it has any weaknesses, we can capitalize on. Um, so for example, you know, if we have a thistle that's a biennial in this bottom picture, we have one year that we can target treatment before it sets seed. Um, other plants like crown vetch in that right picture are vining species. So we may wanna approach treatment in a different manner. Um, we're then going to look at some integrated management strategies to control those species. Um, just in general, before we start going through these, I'm not going to get into any specific herbicide recommendations today since there are many out there and I don't have the time for that today. Um, but I do recommend you look at the guidebook Management of Invasive Plants and Pests of Illinois. It has wonderful recommendations in there. And you can also look at the Midwest Invasive Plant Network for um, specific recommendations. Okay. So we're going to start with some prairie invaders that are grasses, and the first one is smooth brome. This grass is a cool season rhizomatous grass. It was introduced as forage and also planted for erosion control. Unfortunately, it has been reported in every county in Illinois. The way I identify smooth brome is by running my fingers down a leaf blade and feeling for an M-shaped crimp in the leaf. When it comes to management, we can utilize late spring burns to knock back um, this species because that's when it is tending to and starting to enter into its flowering phase, excuse me. Um, and then we can also stimulate the growth of some of our warm season grasses. We can pair that with using a grass specific herbicide um, as well to increase the success of our management. Another cool season grass that we have is tall fescue. Um, this one is a bunch grass and it spread, spreads by expanding its root crowns. You can see its distribution in East, Central, and Southern Illinois. Management for this one is going to be similar to smooth brome. Um, so timing that burning um, at that vulnerable plant life stage um, to knock it back and also promote warm season grass cover. And then again, pairing that with a grass specific herbicide can help increase the success of our results. A third cool season perennial grass is reed canary grass, and this one is also found in nearly every county in Illinois. It tends to like wetter areas, so you'll often see it listed as um, a wetland invasive species as well, um, but I've seen it in numerous prairies, kind of in those lower areas where um, you can have, you know, water collect for a little amount of time or near streams. Um, it invades disturbed areas and is able to reproduce by seed, stem fragments, and rhizomes. 
Um, so if you are doing mechanical control, um, just be aware that you can have um, that plant reproduced through stem fragments as well. So a combination of methods is key with control for this species. Um, so what we would want to do is consider burning or mowing to stimulate new growth and then follow that with an herbicide treatment once the plant has grown about 18 inches tall. I have seen some studies that have done repeated um, annual prescribed fire, um, but again, success is increased if you pair in herbicide treatment with those fire treatments as well. The last grass that we'll look at today is Johnson grass. And unlike the other three, it is a warm season grass. Um, so based on that information, we wouldn't necessarily wanna treat it in the same way as the last three grasses. Johnson grass is rhizomatous, it loves fire, and it persists in abandoned fields. Um, it's more found in central and southern Illinois. And the goal with managing this species is really to get rid of those rhizomes. Um, so it does set viable seed every year, um, but most studies have found that it really doesn't germinate um, and spread via seed, it mostly does through the rhizomes. Okay, so a combination similar to the last species um, of mowing or heavy grazing, um, followed by herbicide application again once that plant is over 18 inches tall and before it sets seed. So whereas with reed canary grass, we do that treatment late spring. With Johnson grass, we'd want to be doing that treatment in summer. So we want that herbicide treatment to go on in between June and August. To identify Johnson grass, um, it does have very sharp leaves. So this is not one you necessarily want to run your, your hand down the leaf blade, because um, I have gotten um, a, a grass cut, a paper cut um, from doing that. But it does have a prominent white midrib on the vein um, that turns red as the season progresses. And it has those very large open inflorescences as well. Okay, let's shift our focus to a couple of legumes or those nitrogen fixers. First is purple crown vetch. And this is a rhizomatous vining plant, which is able to form dense thickets and shade out native vegetation. Hopefully you can see in that bottom right picture, that infestation there with all of those pink flowers, um, just growing over the native warm season grasses in their, in their early stage of growth. Its distribution is pretty scattered throughout the state, but ranges all the way from Northern to Southern Illinois. It was originally introduced as a ground cover and used for erosion control as well. If you do have a small infestation, you can um, hand pull it. Um, if you're just looking to suppress it and not necessarily eradicate, you can use repeated mowing. Um, the best thing that I have seen is doing repeated herbicide application treatments. Um, you can burn and then follow it with an herbicide application, uh, but again, that fire is going to stimulate that regrowth, so you definitely want to make sure that you follow up with an herbicide application. I can identify purple crown vetch by looking for those compound leaves that you can see in the top right corner and those clusters of pea-like pink flowers, and then it is a vining or a climbing plant. Cerisia lespediza or Chinese bush clover is next, and this one is extremely difficult to eradicate. Um, it produces hundreds of thousands of seeds every year that remain viable in the soil for well over 20 years. Uh, it responds positively and very vigorously to fire. Uh, it fixes nitrogen since it is a legume. It's allelopathic, it shades out native vegetation. I could go on and on with this one in particular. Its distribution is mostly limited to central and southern Illinois, um, and it was originally introduced as a forage plant and also used for erosion control in the southeastern United States. Current management recommendations are to pair fire with herbicide application. So burning very early in the season to flush up that growth and then to follow that with a, an herbicide application and to do this repeatedly for multiple years. Um, I have seen restorations that have been completely restarted because they were full of Cerisia. They did multiple targeted herbicide treatments. That restoration looked beautiful. There was no Cerisia coming up and then they stopped managing it and they mowed it at the wrong time of the year and it all came back. Um, so again, this just shows that repeated treatment following it with monitoring is very, very important. <laughs> 
Okay, let's look at a few others. First up is musk thistle, which is an early successional species that establishes in disturbed areas. It is a biennial, so we do have one year where the plant is not producing seeds, and that's when we should be targeting treatment. Um, the seeds also do need light to germinate. You can see it's pretty scattered distribution um, throughout the state. To control this species, we should target the seedling and rosette life stages. So we can apply herbicide to the rosettes in spring or fall. Um, I have seen that there was a recommendation to use fire to kill some of the seedlings, um, but you definitely want to make sure you, you follow up with herbicide um, for any new growth that was promoted by that fire. Um, burning can also, burning off the native plant vegetation can help you see those rosettes a little bit easier. Um, and then if we do focus on um, promoting the growth of warm season grasses, their growth is so dense that we can potentially help shade out um, any of the seed that does hit the seed bank from musk thistle from germinating because it does need that light. Okay, our two teasels are next. We have common and cut leaf. Um, they're able to spread by seed. Um, they are also a biennial to a short-lived perennial. Um, and this just means that they do have a basal rosette and sometimes um, it is there for one year before the plant bolts and sets seed, but sometimes it's there for more than one year. So again, that's the life stage that we would wanna target. Um, we could use herbicide to apply to those rosettes in either spring or fall. If you are looking to just suppress it, um, you can use repeated mowing. You just want to make sure that you're not mowing once that plant has set seed because then you're just acting as a vector to spread it. And then the difference in identifying those comes down to um, comparing their, their leaves. Okay, spotted knapweed is a big problem out west, but several northern counties in Illinois um, unfortunately have reported occurrences of this one. Um, each plant can produce an astounding number of seeds, over 25,000 seeds from a single plant in a single year. Um, they prefer disturbed areas and they are allelopathic. Um, management for these um, includes using herbicide application in the fall or spring on the rosettes. And also, if you have a small infestation, you can pull and bag it. Um, this one is also a biennial or a short-lived perennial, so you do have that life stage um, where you should target your herbicide application um, if you're able to. Okay, yellow and white sweet clover. Um, I really like looking at these distribution maps because yellow sweet clover has been reported in every county, but white sweet clover has a much more limited distribution, and I wonder the extent to which um, the species get confused if they're reported before they're, they're flowering. Um, but regardless, their invasive strategy and management is similar. So they're both common in disturbed areas and have a high seed production with a long seed viability. Um, they are an annual to a biennial herb. Um, so for management, we can hand pull small infestations. Um, I have seen some studies that um, recommended multiple year burning and changing the seasonality of that burn slightly. So doing an early spring burn one year to stimulate growth and then a later spring burn the next year um, in that flowering stage um, to kill the plants before they set seed. Um, again, always pairing that with herbicide um, is a good idea. To identify sweet clover, they do have trifoliate or three-parted leaves um, and they have wavy leaf margins. That's a little bit different than um, some other um, clovers. Okay, and our last invader profile we'll look at today is leafy spurge. Um, this plant can be found in some of the northern counties in Illinois. Uh, you can identify it because it does have a milky sap, and then it produces those green to yellow bracts that look like flower petals, but the flower parts are actually um, very, very um, small and minute, kind of like in a poinsettia, those, those red bracts look like flower petals. Uh, its main invasion strategy is it can develop a very deep and persistent root system um, and has a very high tolerance for disturbance. Um, so control through herbicide alone in the early fall or right before a killing frost um, when done repeatedly for two to three years has been um, shown to be effective, but I've also read studies 
that repeated herbicide treatment for over 20 years has not yet been effective. So um, definitely considering multiple management strategies with this one is a good idea. There have been multiple biological control agents that have been studied and released. Um, if you're not familiar with biological control, this is oftentimes using an insect or maybe a fungal disease to target a specific invasive plant for its removal. Um, they go through very extensive testing periods to make sure they don't have um, adverse effects on other native plants. Um, and I'm not sure if you can see, but in, in the top right picture of this leafy spurge, um, we had released some leafy spurge flea beetles on a small population that we had um, on one of the, the Nature Conservancy's preserves in Minnesota. Okay, let's do a quick recap of some management recommendations as we wrap up today. So the theme that I'll reiterate over and over again, and it's the same across all of our ecosystems, is to use integrated management tactics and repeated efforts. So without several different mechanisms, and a dedication to eradicating these plants, the invasives just aren't gonna go away. So other things to keep in mind are timing your treatments to coincide with the phenology of the plant. Um, and remember, if you're managing invasives in a restoration, the prior site condition and the surroundings of your restoration are going to have an impact and affect the success of your um, restoration and invasive species treatment actions. It's also important to monitor um, for invasion by a secondary invasive species. So you may control for one species and then have another non-native take its place. It can be really easy to get discouraged when we're managing invasions um, and to think that we're perhaps just doing something wrong, but it's important to remember that our ecosystems are always in flux and they're always changing too. Um, so the characteristics of that entire community are going to determine um, the, the chances for invasion and the success of your, of your um, control measures as well. So depending on you know, what types of disturbances you put on that landscape, the intensity, the size, the grazing intensity, the soil characteristics, what plants you have, all of those um, factors play a role and play off of each other and can affect the outcome of, of your uh, management efforts. And these are all changing across space and time. Um, so really what this means is it's helpful if you can use the most up-to-date information in your management actions. Um, so making sure, you know, you're not using a 20-year-old plant inventory of a site to base your management recommendations, but to make sure you're going out, monitoring your site, and knowing what's out there and what you're managing for. Um, so to go with that, I just want to make a plug for monitoring efforts, um, because if you don't know what you have in your prairie or how it's impacted by management efforts, then you're missing out on valuable information. Um, so monitoring will help you answer questions like if your infestation is declining or spreading, if you have new populations that are popping up, if you have secondary invaders establishing, and then hopefully what we want to see is what native plants are thriving after your invasive species treatment. Okay, so that is all that I have for you today. I wanna to thank you all um, for being here today. I do have a brief survey if you have a couple minutes and would like to provide some feedback. Um, you can either scan the QR code that's located on the screen or you can visit that link that is in yellow there. Um, and I think we do have some time for questions. So um, if you have a question, you can put that in the chat box and we'll see if we can, if we can get to it. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, we have had already had a ton of really good questions come in. So Great. I'm just gonna jump right in and, and try to get to as many as we can. Okay. Uh, first off, somebody asked, what's the difference between a prairie and a meadow? Oh, that's a great question. There are it kind of, there are technical definitions between a prairie and a grassland and a meadow. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. A lot of the times um, it kind of is just a different usage of the term. Um, so there are specific definitions, but a lot of the times, you know, a meadow could be um, a prairie as well. Okay. Um, what are the effects of annual burning? And is that too frequent? So um, it depends. I have seen in a, a lot of, restoration recommendations when you're starting um, a new prairie restoration, the annual burning can be beneficial. 
um, but there definitely are um, some plant species that can be negatively impacted by annual burning. And um, I think just in general, that's gonna really promote your grasses and decrease the abundance of your forbs. Um, so if you're trying to keep out invaders, you know, having a really dense abundance of grass can be a good thing. But if you're managing for a higher quality prairie, oftentimes you kind of want to knock back the abundance of those grasses a bit to increase the diversity of forbs that you have. Um, that's just one, I mean, there's lots of different impacts. Fire is complicated, so. <laughs> All right. Um, somebody had a question about CO2 emissions with burning and basically how much um, tons per acre, how much uh, is that a concern with burning? That is a really great question and I do not know off the top of my head. Um, yep, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, when you were talking about grazing and cattle grazing, somebody yeah. asked, can horses be used as, uh, as grazers? Oh, that is not one that I have seen much research that has come out on, um, but I would assume um, that they could to some extent be used. Again, it would, it would um, require understanding what they prefer to graze on, um, but if, you know, um, it mimicked the natural grazing pattern of cattle or bison, then yeah, sure, I could see them being used as a good substitute. Um, is there a source for the rent where the remnant prairies, particularly the, the cemetery prairies are in Illinois? Oh, like a list of where they are yes. located. Yes. Um, I believe, um, I believe I was on the Illinois natural history survey website and that's where I found it. I would start there. Okay. Um, how long do invasive seeds, um, in the seed bank remain viable? That is going to depend on the individual species. Um, so some are just a few years, some can remain, you know, I've seen crazy numbers up to, you know, 40 or 50 years. What percentage of those actually are going to germinate? You know, again, that's going to be dependent on the species. Okay. Uh, somebody asked if reed canary grass is the same canary grass that they see in some uh, bird fin bird food mixes? That's a great question. I don't know, but now I'm going to look it up because I want to know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I would look up the, um, I don't, well, I'm sure it doesn't have the scientific name on the back of the bird seed, but that would be how I would check. Uh, somebody asked you to um, define tillering when you were talking about how burning promotes tillering. Oh, okay. So that's going to be um, where the grasses typically are going to um, put out new vegetative growth um, after being grazed. Okay. Um, if you spray herbicide, uh, if you spray with herbicide, how does that affect bees? And you, you uh, that question came up when you were talking about managing sweet clover. Oh, okay. Um, so with sweet clover, you wouldn't necessarily be wanting to target your spraying when the plant is flowering. Um, that would, you would want to target that for an earlier life stage. Um, so in that regards, hopefully that would minimize um, the number of bees that you have in that area. Okay. Um, somebody asked about herbicides and since many of the herbicides are fairly non-specific. Um, aren't you taking out the native species as well as the invasives when you utilize herbicides? So again, it's going to depend on your specific application methods. So there are numerous different um, ways you can apply herbicide and it depends on how, how big your infestation is. So um, yes, in some cases I've seen, you know, whole restorations that they've decided, okay, it's the the infestation is so bad, we need to take it down to the ground. And in that case, yes, then they did negatively impact the natives. Um, but if you have a smaller infestation, you can do, um, you know, targeted spraying where you're um, really focusing on, on careful application of that herbicide to try to minimize the negative impacts on the native species. Okay. And a really good question came in, and I want to make sure we touch on this one. Uh, since invasive species seem to thrive and disturb soil, would specifically not disturbing the soil be advantageous to native plants? 
So yes, in, um, in a lot of ways, that's a difficult question. So obviously we would want to minimize the soil disturbance um, so that we're, you know, keeping out those invasives to the greatest degree possible. But um, again, disturbance to soil can look differently. Um, so a grazer walking through a prairie, um, that can be a very small disturbance. Um, so some, some natural um, parts of any ecosystem is going to have small scale disturbances. Um, so to a degree, yes, but just with any, you know, management or disturbance that you would do to promote the health of that ecosystem, you're going to have to assume some degree of risk that it's going to also result in a potential invasion pathway. All right. Um, what is the effect of only doing spring burns in a, to a prairie community? So again, um, it gets complicated based on what plants you're trying to um, promote and which you're trying to knock back. So if you do a lot of spring burns, oftentimes, and again, there's differences between early spring burns and late spring burns. Um, if you do a lot of you know, late spring burns, you're going to really promote that abundance of those warm season grasses. And oftentimes what land managers are trying to do is kind of knock them back so you increase the diversity of other species. Um, so a lot of times we want to um, alter and rotate and change the timing of our, um, the seasonality, excuse me, of our burning so that we're not just constantly promoting um, one group of plants, but we're also giving others a chance to, to come back as well. So again, that's gonna pose um, problems when managing for invasives, you know, cause I'm saying always manage it by burning in the spring, but um, then in those off years, you know, if you're not burning in the spring, you can maybe treat with herbicide or use a different tactic as well. Okay, great. Um, we got time for a couple more questions, I think here, we're, we're running out of time, but um, fire impacts pollinators such as butterflies and bees, how can that be mitigated? So again, um, with any disturbance, right, there's going to be some some impacts that you have to time things and determine what your priorities are. So if you're not going to burn to manage to improve the health of that ecosystem, then those those pollinators won't have a healthy ecosystem to be at. Um, we've gotten this concern with, you know, nesting birds and turtles um, and other species as well, but um, there are some considerations to take on timing. Um, but to a degree, some of it, you just have to kind of accept on the small scale to, to improve the health of the overall ecosystem. Okay. Um, one a simple one here is, can you recommend a good field guide for invasive species? Yes, that guidebook that I mentioned before um, is great. Did you say for identification or management? Yeah. Um, they just said field guide of invasive, so I'm assuming identification. Um, so that one doesn't have identification. Honestly, I don't really know. There's a Southern Illinois um, identification guide that's really great for invasives down here. Um, I don't know, Chris, if you have an answer to that. <laughs> um, the Midwest Invasive Plant Network has a Midwestern Invasives field guide. That's a pretty good one. There you go. Okay. All right. I think we'll we'll um, we'll finish maybe just with one more question, if that's okay, because I know we're already running over time here. Um, since bison and cattle grazing help with restoration, uh, do white-tailed deer have any benefits or, or impacts on prairie restoration? So again, that's not something that I have um, personally read too much about or seen if it's studied heavily. Um, you know, when I've been out in prairie restorations, I have seen the deer out there, but I'm not sure to what extent they prefer to browse um, on our prairie species. So it's definitely something to look into. It's a possibility. Okay, great. Uh, well, we have a ton of other questions, but um, we're kind of already running over time and I want to be respectful of people's time. So um, your email is up there on the screen. So I'm mm -hmm. assuming it's okay if people want to, they can um, email you directly with their questions. Yes, definitely.
Great. Well, I definitely want to thank you, Aaron, for a wonderful presentation. And I want to thank everybody here for attending. And I hope uh, to see you back tomorrow. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone.